If you really look at it, I was trying to sell a dream. There was very little I could put in concrete to tell these people it was really real. Those were the words of Charles Kikeo, the father of fiber optics, when describing his efforts at communicating and telecommunica convincing telecommunication companies to use optical fibers. Fast forward to today, that technology is deeply embedded in every aspect of our lives. Fiber optic cables at the bottom of the ocean bring us the, bring us the internet and the entire world to this place in Auckland, New Zealand, where you can access it from your phone. And every time one of those cables is cut by an earthquake or a chip's anchor, entire nations are instantly disrupted. Something that was unthought of 30 years ago, it is now in the palm of our hands. And that is the thing with breakthrough innovations. They seem like dreams, because we can't immediately see their actions and their impact in humankind and how they will change the way we live, because they allow us to create a world that doesn't yet exist. Breakthrough innovations have changed the way we work, get educated, think about health, and even the way we connect with our friends and find dates and entertainment. The same thing happens if we look at more recent innovations, such as using recombinant DNA, which combines DNA molecules of two different species that can be used, for example, to make insulin for diabetics, or natural language processing and neural networks, which allow us to talk to Siri and have our own personal assistant. No one could have anticipated that these technologies, which started out as research, will become precursors for incredible successful companies. Yet, their common thread is that they were founded by deep, deep tech startups. Deep tech startups, as defined by Swati Chaturvedi, co-founder and CEO of investment fund PropelX, refers to technology companies founded in scientific discoveries or meaningful engineering innovations. These innovations are often radical and can create new markets or disrupt existing ones. Having the ability to transform our everyday lives and have meaningful and substantial impact. Many potential new companies based on incredible scientific discoveries and engineering innovations are not getting funded beyond grants and academia. These startups might be equally transformative to humankind and our society as we know it. Yet, they can't tap into the venture capital and investor pockets because the truth is, you need to understand the science behind them. But the majority of investors do not come from a STEM background. They cannot connect and understand the scientific language. In 2011, as I was doing my undergrad in biotechnology engineering, and alongside two co-founders, we spun out of a technology company from our university. Without realizing it, I fell into the business and venture capital, and being a founder was something I had no idea. I was trying to balance science and entrepreneurship, but when it came to talking to people for funding, they couldn't really understand us or provide us the support we needed. That was the first time I encountered this gap between STEM and venture capital. While we were showing them exciting new research and how we can turn waste into a useful new ingredient, they were asking us three to five year business plans, Excel sheets, revenue projections, and numbers. When I experienced this breakdown in communication, I wondered how many others out there were like me. I identified a need and an opportunity to connect these two worlds. And at that moment, my life was changed forever. I knew I wanted to become that bridge between STEM and venture capital, so I could create positive impact for the, for the world. But before I talk about what I'm doing to change this paradigm, let's first look into why is there a disconnect into STEM and VC in the first place. Venture capital, as we know it, originated from the semiconductor industry, which is a deep technology venture uh, used for most electronic circuits. However, the venture capital industry drifted away from deep tech companies and went towards software and internet companies during the 2000s and the dot-com bubble. Software and internet companies became a lot more attractive to investors because they have fast, faster go-to-market timelines, cheaper development costs, and honestly, they can be done by almost anyone. So, because of the way venture capital investing evolved, most investors have background in banking, finance, commerce, and software. 
and use criteria to evaluate these companies based on measuring downloads, clicks, and future growth and revenue. On the other hand, deep tech companies are being built by scientists, engineers, PhDs, and academia. They often come from fields such as chemistry, physics, and biology. And they're making things that are hard to replicate, continuously developing the unknown, and dealing with an immense number of variables and uncertainty. This means investors can measure the technologies in a structured way, making their business models vary each single time, having investors taking technical risks. So, in the end, the gap between both worlds means that the current venture capital landscape is creating a blind spot for investors on traditional VC, making them avoid deep technology ventures. Another barrier for traditional venture capitalists is that deep tech companies are building physical products. According to Boston Consulting Group, 83% of deep tech companies are building or designing a physical product or feature, which requires more funding and longer timelines before they get to market, or even before they achieve a significant milestone that can demonstrate the technology. This also doesn't align with the venture capital landscape, where investors think on four to five years timeline cycles before they move on to the next fund. Deep tech ventures can take up to 10 years to get to market. However, the advantage of this longer timeline is the amount of intellectual property, the know-how the company has built over time, and the incredible solid foundation it has built for future growth. Those things can be copied or replicated overnight. We are seeing progress on the venture capital fund and the investment side, but it is really slow and it's not at the way we need for the direction the world is heading. According to Crunchbase, last year alone, venture capital invested $649 billion between January and September. Yet only 77.5 of those went to deep tech companies. That is less than 12% of the total funding. Additionally, in the last 10 years, funding for deep tech ventures has only increased 25%. So we're still flashing money at software and internet companies. What are most revolutionary technologies and what is going to change the world tomorrow is still relying on grants and government funding. And this is not because the technologies are not there. As of last year, 15,000 different groups worldwide were working on launching deep technology companies. The biggest problem is that founders cannot fully communicate their concepts, ideas, and challenges to an audience that doesn't have a science and engineering background. As I mentioned, most venture capital firms are made of individuals with business and finance degrees. And honestly, the perception is that you do need to have that experience and background to be in the industry. However, my experience has shown me that you can pick up those skills as you go. But in understanding deep tech, science is the hard part. And scientists need funders and investors that can speak their language and support their journey. In this case, the need for more people like me in the venture capital world is apparent, and I'm not the only one that thinks that. According to Hello Tomorrow and Boston Consulting Group, 80% of deep tech founders out of 400 interviewees rank funding and com communication to market access as the top challenge they face. Venture capital funds need to employ scientists with a view of long-term investing. Scientists and engineers are better equipped to evaluate and understand the critical parameters of an early stage startup. And they can help map out the large amounts of scientific and technical hurdles of turning a concept and research to a product in the market. In academia, as many of you might know, researchers often secure funding by describing things that have been done before and describing how their study will fill a gap in hasn't been done before. However, for investors, this doesn't resonate. We need to communicate how, what we will do, how much money do we need, and how we're going to make money out of that. By infiltrating into venture capital, scientists can coach founders on their communication skills and help them secure funding from later stage investors, partners, and customers. Scientists in VC can also provide research and data needed to make informed decisions about where to invest, which allows other investors to better understand the potential risks and rewards 
of, of breakthrough technologies. In addition, there are many aspects of academia that are useful in venture capital, such as that extreme curiosity and that desire to approach things and challenges from a learning, discovery, and experimentation perspective. This, aligned with the ability to look things from a first principle approach, allows investors and science investors to rapidly change our assumptions, just like a deep tech startup, until we found a sustainable and repeatable business model. Since 2016, I have been using my own experience and insights as a deep tech founder turned investor to help other scientists, engineers, and STEM founders to bridge that gap. I have been fortunate to work with over 140 companies, backing founders that initially many VCs have ignored. Having a scientific and founding background, I bring outsider and insider perspectives into industry, academia, and the venture capital world. My advantage is that I can connect with the scientists and the founders before they even have a pitch and when the science is still research, helping them make their dreams to reality. The companies I have invested in have allowed me to expand my scientific curiosity beyond my primary domain of expertise and definitely beyond my wildest dreams. Thanks to the teams I work with, I have seen what the next generation of precision fermentation and food and alternative proteins will look like. Or how can we use AI to identify native forests? I have worked with clinicians and engineers to see how wearable devices can ensure better rehabilitation outcomes for patients after surgery. Or how can we use machine learning to deliver <laughs> better patient outcomes? Eh? And I have witnessed in awe of how we can learn and find inspiration from nature to develop new materials derived from sheep or produced by bees. We don't know what the next 20 or 50 years will look like, but I can assure you that almost every layer of our world is likely to be reshaped by tech. And our most pressing global problems cannot be solved with an app. The most important technologies that will define our future are being developed now. They focus on the future of green energy and clean energy to help drive towards zero, net zero green emissions, converting biology and information technologies to improve health, longevity, and human performance, transforming our food value chains, and uncovering the future of space technologies. I called you to think, how are we gonna use that to create a better world for generations to come? Scientists and venture capitalists need to join forces and fundamentally change the future. And just as Charles K. Keo, I dare you to dream. Let's build the world we want to live in. Thank you.